Welcome to Crosswords, the podcast about practical Christianity. What does it look like to walk in Jesus' footsteps? How do I live in a culture hostile to godliness? These are questions that we'll answer on each podcast as we get our heart and mind on Jesus. All scriptures quoted are from the New International Version. You can follow me on Twitter at Kingdom underscore Saint. Walk with the Lord today and be a blessing. As human beings, we display a wide range of emotions. This is something unique in God's creation. One of the most misunderstood emotions is anger. In our culture, anger is sometimes represented by different images like a raging bull with smoke or clouds coming out of his nostril, an emoji with also clouds or smoke coming out of their nostrils or perhaps with their nose bright red or some part of their face red while they're grimacing in anger. And these icons are usually quite accurate when representing the Hebrew phraseology for anger which God describes that he is slow at getting. We go back to our verse describing God's character, Exodus 34, verse 6, which reads, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. So far we've looked at the Hebrew words for compassionate and for gracious, which are rakum, and kanun, respectively. Rakum, or compassionate, uh, means God's tender and protective affections, akin to the womb, a safe place, a nurturing place. Whereas gracious, from the Hebrew kanun, means God's favor on the undeserving, the undeserving interest God takes in us to improve and bless our lives. And the next one that we're going to take a look today, slow to anger, which is two words, arik, which means slow or long, and af, which means a breathing place, which means the nose or the nostrils or the face, and also means anger. So this could be interpreted in a few different ways. It could mean slow breathing, arik af, long breaths or slow breaths patient, right? You're breathing evenly. (laughs) Long-suffering means that God is even-keeled. It speaks to God's evenness of disposition. He doesn't get easily tense or anxious. He doesn't allow other people's emotions or dysfunction to get him out of kilter. He doesn't easily have a cow. (laughs) So there's another Hebrew word often used to describe anger, the word chara, as used in the following verse, in 1 Samuel 17, 28, which reads, When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger. He burned, chara, with anger, which is af. Uh, Af, remember, means a breathing place, which could mean the nose, the nostrils, or the face. It also is used for anger. And chara means kindled, angry, displeased, burning, incensed. So chara is a word for hot, uh, furious, uh, burning, kindled. Uh, and this is also used of God in Exodus four, fourteen, when it reads, Then the Lord's anger, af, burned, chara, against Moses. So taking into consideration all these Hebrew words, We can say that when you get angry in Hebrew terminology, you burn hot, or your anger is kindled, which is how the KJV translates it. Transliterated, it is understood as your nose is burning hot, which the emoticons I described earlier clearly portray. Your nose is burning hot, some part of your face is red, or you have clouds or smoke coming out of your nostrils, right? Uh, Because the word af, which is anger, is also the word for nostrils or face or breathing place. So we can say God's nose or 
or God's anger, takes a long time to burn hot. God's breathing is slow and even. It takes a lot to get his breathing fast paced. <laughs> He's of even disposition. He is even keeled. He doesn't get easily tense or anxious. He doesn't allow other people's emotions or dysfunctions to get him out of kilter. He doesn't easily have a cow. God has a high degree of tolerance, and not just tolerance, but an outlook of compassion. We all have a nose. We all have a breathing place. We all have an af, uh, as the Hebrew word describes, and we usually breathe normally. Take a breath in, take a breath out. Our breathing doesn't get fast paced unless we're exercising, which is normal and expected. But what are other things that can make your breathing rapid and uneven? Eh, emotions, stress in particular, anger. <laughs> These things can get our anger, our nose, kindled. It can get our anger burning. Those of us raised in Western ways of thinking, we tend to think of anger as something bad, an emotion we'd rather not deal with or even try to understand in others. We treat anger as a problem, as something we need to weed out of our character. I think that's why we have so many outbreaks and dysfunctions when it comes to this. But it's normal to get angry. Good people get angry. Normal people get angry. If someone doesn't get angry, then something's not normal, I would say. Now, to be a hothead is not a good thing. That's not good to let your anger control you. It's not a good thing. It's not a good thing to let any emotion control you or lead you in making decisions that you might later regret. And the Proverbs speak to that. Proverbs 15, 8. A hothead person stirs up conflict, but the one who is patient calms a quarrel. And the Hebrew words for this is quite interesting. Hothead here is the Hebrew word kema, which means heat, poison, rage. Whereas the word for patient, guess what? It's arik af. The same two words God used to describe how he is slow to anger. So the Bible speaks of anger as a normal part of our repertoire of emotions. We see that in Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, where the Apostle Paul says, in your anger do not sin, which he's actually quoting Psalm 4, verse 4, which we will see in a minute. He says, in your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. This verse assumes we're going to get angry, <laughs> but we don't need to let anger rule us or define us any more than any other emotion. If we let anger rule us, that is, we're letting days pass by and we're still angry, we're going to bed angry, that's when we open ourselves to allow the devil to trip us up. Hence, we're giving the devil a foothold. So this verse teaches us that although it's normal to get angry, we don't want to let it become sin by taking it to bed and therefore giving it control over your life to the devil. Paul, as I said before, is actually quoting Psalm 4 here, Psalm 4, verse 4, where it says, Tremble and do not sin in the NIV. When you're on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. So the Hebrew word there for tremble is ragaz. And it's very interesting because this verse, uh, this verb, sorry, means to shake or quiver or tremble as with a violent emotion like fear, rage, or anger. So to tremble, to ragaz, means to be disturbed, troubled, or fretful. It is normal to get into this state, but search your heart as to why and give it to the Lord. That's what the psalm is saying, right? Tremble and do not sin when you're on your beds. Search your heart. And be silent. To be silent here is a way of saying, trust God with it. Give it to God. Don't try to resolve what's making you tremble with your own misguided presumptions. If you're taking it to bed, it means it's got a hold of you already. You need to give it to the Lord. So often we get angry. 
and that is normal. But can we try and understand the emotion itself? What is it teaching us? Is it saying something about us? Is it saying something about God? When we misunderstand the emotion of anger, we may think God's slowness to anger is at odds with the many instances in Scripture when we're told that his anger is kindled. Now, we all have the capacity to display emotions that come straight from God's image. We were made in his image, which is why God is so relatable to us in the way he discloses himself throughout the Scripture. He's not an emotionless or one-dimension God. He describes all of his emotions and does so without apology. Similarly, there is no apology to be made when we display our emotions, unless, of course, we have sinned in any one of them. When we get angry, we can have the propensity to sin in our anger because often our anger is an expression of something we're not able to control or accomplish or understand. We feel powerless and we may vent, and that's when it can lead to sin. That doesn't mean that when I get angry, I'm sinning. I get angry with my children because I care for them. I get angry with people I work with or with situations because I care. Sometimes I wish I wouldn't care that much, but I do care, and I'm not going to apologize for that. However, as James teaches in James 1, 19 and 20, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. God wants us to be like him, to be slow to anger. But James adds this, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So James makes a distinction between human anger and divine anger. We should never presume our anger is justified or divine because that in and of itself could lead us to sin. Anger gets kindled in us because we care. We deeply care. It's okay to care. When I'm angry, I tell myself, vent your anger. I'm going to get angry for, for 10 seconds. Ah! and then let it go. Oh, and I feel great when I do that because then I don't have to sleep on it. I don't have to take it to bed. Why well, I don't let it drive me nuts. I just acknowledge it. I understand where it came from. Hey, I care. Can I do something about it? Probably not. Hey, even when God was angry, why did he get angry? Because he was not able to control his people who are usually the cause of his anger. <laughs> That's part of having relationships, isn't it? When we care for each other, we're bound to get angry at some point. And we have to learn to accept each other's emotions. Learning to be tolerant. Giving each other room to grow. Room to learn. Room to mature. Sometimes it may be hard to track where your anger is coming from and what triggers it. That's when you need some extra help, like anger management. In anger management, you learn to track your anger so you can get in front of it and manage it adequately before it runs you over. <laughs> and journaling is a great tool to use in this kind of therapy. We see the psalmist use journaling. That's what the psalms are. They're journals of these godly people that were dealing with their emotions, trying to vent their emotions in, a, in an appropriate way and ultimately realizing that God is always the answer. We always have to defer to God. You see, God's anger never gets mismanaged. It is never out of control. God is not only willing to tolerate, but to be patient. His patience is as much a display of his love as is his anger. He's quick to forgive, and he doesn't hold on to his anger as we do. Check out Micah 7, 18 and 19, which reads, Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. I love that part where he says, you don't stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. Likewise, in Psalms chapter 30, verse 4 and 5, it reads, Sing the praises of the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name, for his languor, sorry, for his anger 
lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Oh, I love that. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. These scriptures teach us that God favors, favors mercy, favors showing compassion. He tips the scales when it comes to expressing his anger. His anger is short, it's controlled, it's righteous, for he's always looking to impart favor on his people rather than judgment. He delights in showing mercy rather than condemning. His anger doesn't manipulate him or cloud his judgment. And we need to have the right perspective about our anger to better relate to the Lord in the right context so that our anger doesn't sweep us up and lead us astray. That's how people misunderstand God's anger because they only see it in human terms or in negative terms. For their anger has probably been a negative experience for them. And so they try to attribute God's anger to be like theirs. And that is a big mistake. God's anger is not what defines him, as we see in these verses. Rather, that he is slow to anger because his favor, his love, his mercy and compassion is what he chooses to display even when there is a cause for anger and even when he has been angry. God's anger is not unpredictable or irrational as human anger may tend to be. Irrational human anger is just an extension of irrational and unpredictable people. But responsible, loving, and caring people, they also get angry. And we may tend to take notice when we see that because it makes them relatable and human. And we interpret their anger as a display of great caring for something. Their anger is quite predictable because it's tied to their morality. They get angry when there is something immoral, unjust, or illegally done that would bring harm to others or disrupt relationships. That's a good anger. But even in that kind of anger, the responsible and moral person would be able to temper it with patience, forgiveness, and compassion. Even in that anger, moral people defer to God and don't attempt to judge, but they leave it to the Lord. This is the kind of anger that does not get out of control, that it's properly contextualized. The anger of the Lord uh, is yet another way that we can see how much He cares for us. This is our God. He, he cares. He's involved. And we need to learn what can cause His anger to be kindled so that we can gain His favor and His blessing. Psalm 103, verse 9 and 10 will say, He will not always accuse, nor will He harbor His anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. So this is the Lord. His anger doesn't, ju doesn't cloud his judgment because it says he will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. In Isaiah 54, 9 and 10, it says, Now I have sworn not to be angry with you, never to rebuke you again. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. Again and again, the Lord makes it clear His anger comes from a place of caring, not hating. It is revealed as a warning for our good, not displayed to make us cower in fear, unless we're dull enough to need that. Unless our anger has gotten the best of us and we're judging God according to our limited understanding, we will understand and we will take God's anger as a display of His care for us. But anger that is out of control in humans will lead to bad judgment. Emotions tend to impair our judgment, even good emotions. We shouldn't be making big decisions when we're happy, sad, or angry. Emotions cloud our judgment. But God's judgment is never impaired because His anger is always justifiable and is always kept in check and never gets the best of him. As we see when Abraham and Moses intercede for Sodom and Israel, respectively. In Genesis 18, 32, uh, 
Abraham says, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. This is like the third or fourth time he's interceding before Sodom and Gomorrah. What if only 10 righteous people can be found there in Sodom? God answers, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. When God's anger would be released over Sodom and Gomorrah in judgment, God accepted Abraham's negotiation. He was willing to skip the destruction of the cities for 10 righteous people found in them. Were they found? No. <laughs> Noah was the only one found righteous in the entire world. Would 10 be found in Sodom? No, they were not. But <laughs> there was one righteous soul there, Abraham's nephew Lot, and God helped him escape before the judgment swept the city away. Would Lot have been spared if not for Abraham's intercession? There were many times that Moses interceded for the wicked from Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. For the rebellious people of Israel, Moses stood the gap many times. Many times God's anger was kindled at their rebelliousness, and he was about to wipe them out and remake Israel through Moses. But Moses... Moses interceded. Sometimes it was Moses and Aaron interceding, asking God to relent from his anger, and God did. He was willing to back down. And this is proof that God's anger never gets the best of him. As long as you are able to approach him and willing to approach him, willing to humble yourself before him, seek his face and forgiveness, God is right there, always wanting to take you back because God's anger is righteous. It's unapologetic. It's pure. It's a caring anger. He is passionate about us. Thank you very much for listening. I hope the Lord gave you insight into conforming to Jesus with today's message. I always appreciate feedback. You can send me your thoughts, musings, and comments directly through the Anchor app. You can also contact me on Twitter at Kingdom underscore Saint. Walk with the Lord today and be a blessing.